So we're going to be reading out of Matthew chapter 3. We're going to be starting with verse 13. We're going to read through 17. So y'all can all be going ahead and turning there. So before we get started, let's just pray. And let's just ask God to bless this and open our hearts and our ears. So everybody bow your heads. Dear God, I come to you tonight. Um, I pray that you would just open our hearts and our ears to receive this message. I pray that you would just bless what you have given me to share, God, and I pray that it would not come from my heart, but yours, God, and that you would speak through me and help it to minister to somebody tonight, God, and change their life. In your name I pray, amen. Okay, so I want to start out with a little story. So I've been preparing for this for quite some time, since around August, and I kept all of my notes and all my summer reading, ew, right, in a binder, and so I was keeping it all organized, well, I took it with me to California whenever we went to National Fine Arts, which y'all need to do fine arts. It's awesome. If you don't know what it is, talk to Brittany. <laughs> um, so I kept it in this blue binder, and I took it with me to California. Well, we get back on a Saturday. School starts Monday. Wake up that morning, ready to do a type all my summer reading up, work on this some more. So I'm looking for my binder. Can't find it anywhere. Yay. So... I'm like looking through all my bags, through my mom's bags, looking everywhere. So I start to think, start to think, and I left it on the airplane. All of it is gone. So school's Monday. It's Saturday. I'm freaking out. So I've got to reread all the books that I didn't read in the first place and type everything up in like a couple of hours. Well, I did it, and I got some new notes. But my point of this story is there is another story that a famous pastor by the name of Cody Griggs told me. And um, <laughs> he told me the story of this pastor. His youth pastor was coming to speak before the congregation. And so he went up to him and was like, man, you got your notes ready? He was like, yeah, I got them. He was like, are they in your heart? He was like, well, of course they're in my heart. So he takes all of his notes away, sends them out onto the stage with just a microphone. And he's like, I hope you got it in your heart, man. Well, I do have notes to keep me on track, but it is in my heart, so I'm just going to share it with y'all. I've got it written down. So, I hope you all have found Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. So, we're going to read from that. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. And when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens opened up to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. Duh. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. All right, pause there. So Jesus is getting baptized. This is a big deal. Like, Jesus is getting baptized. It's a big deal in many different ways. First off, we have the Trinity. We have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we have all three there. And you know whenever the heavens literally opened up, you know when the heavens open up and the Trinity shows up, you know it's important and something big is about to happen. The second way that this was a big deal is the Father affirmed Jesus. Jesus' identity was found in what the Father said to him. He said that he was well pleased. Now, I want to um, point something out to you. In chapter 3, Jesus is getting baptized. But in chapter 4, we see that he is being tempted. But I want to show you tonight that these two events were not supposed to be viewed as separate events, but one event whole. So no chapter break. This was meant to be read as a whole because it is an example as to what believers will face. See, there's a connection between the water and the wilderness. See, really, I shouldn't have even read Matthew chapter 4. I should have read Mark chapter 1. So let's go to Mark and see what he has to say about it. It came to pass in those days that Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee and was, and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he said 
He saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then voice from heaven came, saying, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Immediately, we see no chapter break, but immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. So this word immediately is what has got me so confused. How can he go from being baptized to being straight in a battle, being in total comfort to being in total conflict? First, he's being baptized and he hears a voice from heaven. The next, he's in the wilderness and he hears a voice from hell. It's like when you come to church on Wednesdays and then the next day you go into your wilderness, you go into school, and it feels like the devil is attacking everything that you laid at the altar. One moment, you're stepping out in faith, and the next, you're confronted with fear. One moment, you're praying for your enemies. The next, you want to say a few choice choice words that don't need no interpretation. So Jesus' baptism was a big deal. It was another, it was also a big deal, because an announcement, a truth, was declared. It was this, I'm loved, I'm a child of God, and he is pleased with me. I am loved, I am a child of God, and he is pleased to me. Turn to your neighbor and say, I am loved, I am a child of God, and he is pleased with me. All right. I hope that you understood it from your neighbor because this is a truth that will change your life. It will change how you feel when you wake up in the morning, when you walk into a room, Because no matter what you do, if you believe that, if you get that in your heart, no matter what happens, you know that you are loved, you are a child of God, and he is pleased with you. So let me ask you this. What if you filtered every circumstance, every bad thing, every negative comment somebody told you through that truth? You wouldn't lose your joy so easy. But this is where, as believers, this is where we stop. We stop at the water because that is where our identity is confirmed. That is where we find ourselves. But I want to point out to you that when Jesus got baptized, it was before he had done any miracles. He hadn't healed the blind. He hadn't raised the dead. He hadn't even been to the cross yet. Yet God still says, I love you, you are my child, and I am pleased with you. This is where we stop because this is where we are comfortable. This is our spiritual high. This is us coming back from youth camp, youth convention, deeper. But, but you will go back to your wilderness. You will have to go back to school. You'll be around your friends again. But let me tell you this. An approval from heaven does not stop an attack from hell. You cannot have your water experience in the wilderness. You have to face those trials and you have to make those decisions on your own. So I want to challenge you tonight that you make the right decisions. So there is a connection, like I mentioned before, between the water and the wilderness. We see it um, when Jesus gets baptized. He goes from the water to the wilderness. We see it in John because when John baptized Jesus, he actually had just got done preaching in the wilderness. We also see it with the Israelites. Moses led them from the wilderness to the Red Sea, and they walked through the water. So water through the wilderness. See, the Israelites, Pharaoh saw them as slaves. But they were not slaves. They were God's children, and he loved them, and he was pleased with them. And when you're a child of God, there's no bondage that can hold you down, no addiction that cannot be stopped, and no decision will change the fact that God loves you. And you are his, and he is pleased with you. Because whoever the sun sets free is free indeed. So, how do we not let the trials in the wilderness stop our experiences in the water? Just because you're in the wilderness doesn't mean that you can't make the right decisions. Because it is possible. So, tonight, you're in church this is the water. Tomorrow, got to go back to school. And that's the wilderness. But the wilderness really isn't the problem. It's who is in the wilderness. Satan. And he hates you. He sits, and he waits, and he watches. 
then he attacks. He sits and he waits and he watches, and then he attacks. Just like in Adam and Eve, he appeared as the snake, and he sat, and he waited, and he watched, and he attacked. That got us in the predicament that we are in today. So I want to tell you a fun fact. Did you know snakes don't blink? They sit, and they wait, and they watch and get ready to attack. So I have a story about a lady, and she had a pet snake. I know, creepy, right? So she had a pet python, and she took it to the vet, and she explained to the vet, my snake has not been eating for, like, months now. Can you please help him? I think he's sick. The vet goes, the vet goes, um, do you let your snake sleep with you at night? She was like, well, yeah, he crawls in bed with me sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I know, pretty creepy. And the vet was like, well, do you wake up and you see him stretched out beside you? She was like, well, yeah, he does that often. And the vet goes, um, sorry to tell you this, but your snake is preparing to eat you. The vet said that the snake is stretching itself out to size her up so that it can eat her. See, this is what the devil does when we are in our wilderness. He sizes us up, getting ready to make his attack. So how are you going to win your war in the wilderness? I'm going to give you a couple of points, but you have to know that your decisions, what you make, once you make it, those decisions are all that you own. And even though the consequences may not happen immediately, they will happen. And right now, it may not seem bad consequences like you get in trouble, oh, okay, not that big deal, you get your phone taken away. But when you get older, maybe you get in trouble, you have a lot more to lose. You can lose your house, you can lose your kids. So I want you to know that the decisions, the decisions that you make today are affecting your future, even though, even if you may not know it or not. So I'm going to give you four points on how to win the war in the wilderness. Number one, um, you must know where you are. See, I want to point out at the beginning of Jesus' ministry is where the devil attacked. Before, God had done, before Jesus had done any miracles, the devil was already attacking him. See, Satan wants to stop you before you even get started, and you have to realize that. How many of you feel like from the moment, the moment that you were born, it's feel like the devil has just been attacking you and attacking you, and there's no breakthrough? It's because even the enemy sees potential and purpose in your life because there is potential and purpose in your life because God put it there. That's why whenever you're going through a breakthrough, when you're about to hit your breakthrough, that's why it might seem so hard, like the attack is so intense. But you have to know where you are in order to find the path to victory. All right, number two, the word is your weapon. It is your only weapon. If you notice, Jesus' response to the... Um, to Satan whenever he was in the wilderness was, it is written, it is written. He quoted scripture, and he quoted, he quoted scripture to defeat the devil, and that's exactly how we have to do it too. See, in the water, the word comes over you, but in the wilderness, it has got to come from inside you, and there's no way to put it in there unless you take the time out to do it. So an example would be like a camel. So a camel, whenever it eats or it drinks, it takes in more than it can hold, and that's the humps on its back as its little storage. So but that doesn't matter how hot the desert gets, doesn't matter what troubles that it faces, it is always going to have water because it took the time to put it in there. Um, number three is you have to realize what is at stake. You see, Jesus made every single decision with your destiny in mind. He was thinking about all of you. Not, e not only whenever he was in the water and in the wilderness, but also whenever he was hanging on the cross. 
See, Jesus did not only come to die to the death that we deserved, but he also came to live the life that we are supposed to live. And you aren't only living for yourself. There are people that will come after you. There are people that are watching you all the time, watching the decisions that you make because the, decision, the decisions that you make today will affect your future. And number four, as the, or as Sydney, you can come on up. You have to know where your help comes from. You see, after Satan had left Jesus in the wilderness, the angels came and they ministered to him. They poured back into him. So when you're in a trial, when you're in, when you're in your battle, you cannot stop worshiping. Do not stop worshiping. Even whenever you're in here and you feel like you just don't want to do it, that is the devil trying to stop you because you are in your wilderness and you're trying to come get some water. You cannot stop worshiping and you cannot stop crying out because God will show up right where you are. Your help comes from the Lord. He is your defender and he is your protector. So tonight, I don't know what wilderness you are in, what wilderness you have to go back to, what wilderness you have to face tomorrow or next week. But do not let your decisions affect your experiences with God. We may not always make the right decisions, but there's still hope at the end. I myself have not made the right decisions. But I'm still standing up here right now, sharing it to y'all. I read this book, and in the book it said that learned experience, experiences that you learn from your own mistakes, is not a very good way to learn. It's better to learn from other people's mistakes. And I have not done that. So I've had to learn from my own mistakes. So I really wanted to come up here tonight so that y'all will learn from me. Your decisions that you make, even though they may seem small, they are so much bigger and the truth will always find you. No matter how hard you try to cover it up or how hard you try to hide it. Because we are all born with a purpose. And the devil will try to take that away from you. You have to be prepared and you have to understand that your decisions are so important. Because if you make the wrong ones, you very well will be left with all that. So tonight... If you're sitting here tonight and you're thinking, yes, I'm in a wilderness and I'm completely lost, that is okay to recognize that because I didn't recognize that. And I'm telling you right now that you need to pray and you need to recognize that. So with your heads bowed, I want you to think really hard right now. Are there decisions that you have been making that you know you're not supposed to, even though it may may seem small. I want you to think long. I want you to think hard, and I want you to pray in your own words right now, in your own head if you have to, that your decisions affect you. So we're about to open up these altars, and I want to encourage you to come up here And lay it down at the altar. And tomorrow, if the devil tries to attack you, you need to think back to this point right here. And you need to recognize that you already laid it down. You already gave it away. Don't pick it back up. 
So as Sydney begins to sing the song, I want you to go ahead and make your way up here and just lay it on the altar.